So now I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Becca Huber, PhD. Um, she is a clinical neuropsychology fellow at Emory within the Department of Rehabilitation Medicine. She completed her doctoral degree at Idaho State University, where she studied metacognitive strategies for older adults with and without neurodegen neurodegenerative disorders. She finished her internship through the ICANN School of Medicine at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York City, where she fell in love with acute rehabilitation populations. At Emory, she primarily serves the acute care inpatient rehabilitation unit. Here, she provides both neuropsychological assessment and treatment services for people who have undergone neurological and physical trauma, while she communicates important assessment and treatment aspects to an interdisciplinary treatment team. Additionally, she serves the outpatient community by providing cognitive assessments, cognitive rehabilitation therapy, and individual psychotherapy. So clearly, um, she's got her hands tied. She's clearly making an impact in the community, and we appreciate her contributions thus far. Today, she will inform us of metacognitive literature and the connection to perspective memory, which is um, which relates to how we remember to do tasks beyond the present and the future. So this topic is, is so useful to us at CEP because we will learn concrete steps um, that can improve perspective memory in everyday life. Um, and it's useful to anybody, I imagine. So I look forward to learning some things. So again, I wanna encourage you all um, to be present, be engaged, um, talk with us. And of course, if you have any questions, you can always email us at empowerment at emory.edu. So I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Becca Huber. I'm gonna let her share her screen. Welcome, Becca. Thank you for that lovely introduction. I'm sharing my screen now. Let me know if you can see it. Yes, I can. I'm just gonna go ahead and make sure you're spotlit. And I'm gonna fade into the background. Enjoy everybody. All right, thank you everyone for joining today. Um, my topic today is really about addressing your stress from forgetting because forgetting is very stressful. So I'm really gonna talk about the concept of perspective memory and metacognitive intervention strategies that might help our perspective memory ability. So I thought the best place to start for this would be um, kind of defining what perspective memory is because that's not a memory that we tend to, to hear about very often. Usually we hear about short-term, long-term memory, um, but perspective memory is just simply defined as remembering an intention in the future. So some examples of this include um, remembering to take a medication like insulin or hypertension medication at a specific time or um, with a specific meal or something like that. But it could also be as simple as just remembering to brush our teeth every day. So perspective memory is one of the things that people that I see in clinical work tend to come to me with complaints about like, oh, I forgot to get to my appointment on time or I forgot to take this medication. I forgot to turn the stove off. There's a lot of perspective memory complaints that I, I hear in a clinical setting and um, they are of both minimal importance sometimes and sometimes maximal importance to our health and our stress and our ability to maintain our longevity. So failure to do these things can, can result in some hazardous health problems, like forgetting to take our hypertension medication could result in a stroke. Um, but you know, forgetting to brush our teeth might just give us some unduly social consequences where our friends think our breath stinks sometimes. Um, whether you're forgetting to brush your teeth or forgetting to take your medication, it obviously has a functional importance in our life. Um, and so it's important to kind of think about the different factors that affect our ability to be successful in perspective memory. So some of those factors include how a perspective memory task is supposed to be remembered, whether it's on a time frame, so that's a time-based cue, or if it's coupled with an event, so that's an event-based cue. So a good example I like to use for this is if you're supposed to remember to take a medication at 7 p.m., that's remembering on a time-based cue. If you're supposed to remember to take a medication with a dinner, dinner is an event, so that's an event-based cue. That's kind of how we think about those things. Um, other factors that affect our perspective memory performance is whether the, the memory task has to be remembered over a short term or a long term. So some short term tasks would be, you know, remembering to, to call your loved one in 20 minutes 
or a long-term task could be, you know, remembering to get to that dentist appointment six months from now, since we tend to schedule those out so far in advance. Um, those are the things that could be forgotten about relatively easy because a lot of interference can happen whenever there's longer time between when we encode the task and when we're supposed to remember it. Um, and then the environment type that the task is supposed to happen in has an effect on our perspective memory ability as well. So, um, you know, I play a lot in the research sphere and we're reading a lot of research articles where um, researchers are looking at perspective memory, but it's just in the lab-based environment. But there's been some studies done that show that older adults and, and those with mild cognitive impairment actually tend to perform a little bit better in their home-based environments and in their naturalistic environments, environments that they're more used to. Um, another environment that perspective memory tasks happen in are, are medical environments. So kind of remembering to tell your doctor um, what's been going on with you. So obviously there are a lot of factors and a lot of um, cues and tasks and environment types that can impact our ability to be successful in this sphere. But I'm here to talk to you guys about perspective memory in older adults. So um, we'll kind of put the younger adults aside for a little bit and talk about how perspective memory um, is actually a little bit worse as we age just generally. Even if you're a healthy ager, people tend to have more perspective memory failures. Um, and it's because of all of the different factors that I just talked about, the environment type, how long the perspective memory task takes to, to actually come to fruition, and um, whether it's a time-based or a event-based task. And so research indicates that both healthy and older adults with neurocognitive problems report increased rates of perspective memory um, difficulties in their life. And past literature has really pointed to some strong evidence that perspective memory impairment in those with mild cognitive impairment um, is often more prevalent than in healthy older adults. Some authors have said that um, perspective memory performance actually can indicate the presence of um, a future neurodegenerative neurodegenerative disorder. So whether your mild cognitive impairment could potentially result in a dementia. So, you know, the worst you do on perspective memory tasks, usually that's an indicator of future neurocognitive decline too. Um, and on top of this, not only is, you know, this kind of complicating the picture for older adults and specifically those with mild cognitive impairment, um, it also, perspective memory failures can also have um, increased stress for close others in your environment um, because there's a greater reliance on these other people whenever your perspective memory is failing you all the time. So, and the, there's a lot of different words for close others, so we can call them informants or care partners or, you know, loved ones, but regardless of their title, these people in our close environment tend to take on more responsibility when we're having perspective memory difficulties. So this has led me to the, to kind of turning my research and my attention toward um, metacognition and perspective memory. And a lot of the times when I'm talking with people, they've maybe heard the term metacognition, but they don't actually know what it is. Um, so I'm going to do a brief introduction of what metacognition is and tie it to how it affects our ability to either be successful in our perspective memory or to fail in our perspective memory attempts. So there's this lovely little model on the side here that is our metacognitive model. But to define metacognition first, it's our um, awareness of our own thoughts and personal cognitions. So this can be applied to perspective memory. So we can have thoughts and awareness related to our own perspective memory performance. The figure is the hallmark model of metacognition, and this was first kind of depicted in 1990, so it's getting older and older each and every day. Um, but this model really depicts our real-world perspective memory tasks occurring at the object level. Um, so this is where the behavior and the, the performance happens, our perspective memory task happens. So if we're sticking with... Um, you know, the example of taking a medication at 7 p.m., the, the behavior of actually taking that medication at 7 p.m. is occurring at this object level. 
The meta level is our judgment about our perspective memory ability. So this is our kind of thoughts or our own personal awareness of how good we are at performing at the, the object level. So these can be general. So something along the lines of I'm generally really good at remembering things or they can be more task specific like, oh, I'm you know, I'm really good at remembering to take my medications, but I'm maybe not so good at remembering to turn off the stove after I'm done cooking. So these judgments that we make at the meta level can lead us to implement different um, supports in our in our lives to help us be better at this object level, to help us actually remember the task that we need to. And then we kind of go on this monitoring side of the, the model here where um, we're, we're monitoring how well we did and updating our judgments and then implementing new um, supports if we need to, to help us be better at our, our performance level. So judgments can, can help us be more accurate and help us implement the supports that we need to. So it's really important for our judgments that are happening at our meta level to be um, accurate. If they're inaccurate, maybe we aren't implementing the supports we need to, and then we're not, you know, being successful in the perspective memory task. And this is all very theory heavy right now. I promise I'll get to some real world examples. Um, but all of this to be said, having the ability to accurately judge can lead us to have better perspective memory performance. And as we get older, just in general, our ability to accurately judge ourselves tends to decline. But when we introduce neurocognitive disorders like myocognitive impairment and dementia to, to the mix, um, then our ability to be more accurate tends to decline even more. So this is why I'm interested in this area of research. So there isn't a lot of research out there on the intersection of our perspective memory performance and metacognition, and particularly those that intersection of concepts within the older adult population. So to date, there's one article talking about this, and it's mine that was just published um, with my colleague, Dr. Fulton. Um, it was just published this year. And what we did in this study is we aimed to detect if there were differences between older adults who are healthy and older adults who have been diagnosed with myocognitive impairment and their ability to accurately judge both their general perspective memory and task-specific perspective memory. So through this study, we had people come into the research lab who had diagnoses of, of mild cognitive impairment, and we would kind of put them through the ringer of different tests. And if you guys have ever undergone a neuropsychological evaluation, you understand how torturous that can be. Thankfully, because this was just a research project, we didn't have to do as many tasks as we do on a typical neuropsych evaluation. Um, but we did really test perspective memory performance. And we had people um, rate how well they think they did on different tasks that we had them complete in the lab and at home. We also examined how others that were relationally close to them, I'm gonna to refer to them as informants, where we, we collected how informants would rate the participants on the perspective memory tasks as well. So for example, we would ask their care partners or the informants, how well do you think your loved one would do on this task that they're gonna perform in the laboratory? Um, and we compared the difference in accuracies between the informants and the participants. So were informants more accurate in their judgments than the participants? Was there any difference between those with mild cognitive impairment and those who are healthy in the older adult range? So what we found was those with mild cognitive impairment just generally reported more perspective memory complaints than their healthy counterparts. Um, and we also found that those with mild cognitive impairment did actually perform worse on the prospective memory tests in the lab compared to the healthy group. But um, something that was interesting was that generalized accuracies, so the, the kind of relationship between um, how people generally reported their prospective memory was doing in their day-to-day -day life, 
um, versus how they um, actually did on prospective memory tests weren't significantly different between healthy and those with mild cognitive impairment, like those groups. What was interesting, though, is that those with mild cognitive impairment were more inaccurate and overconfident on their task-specific um, predictions of their performance. So when we would ask, how well do you think you'll do on this prospective memory task, they would overrate themselves compared to how they actually performed on the measure. Um, what we thought was really exciting, though, about this literature was, or about this study, was that the mild cognitive impairment and the healthy groups benefited on the long-term prospective memory tasks after having been exposed to having to think about how they would rate and how they did on the first task. So how our experiment kind of lined out was that they would come in, um, we would give them a couple tasks, we'd ask them how they would how they thought they would do on those tasks. Once the tasks were completed, we'd ask them how they thought that they did afterwards. And then we would give them two more tasks to remember for when they got home. So on those final two tasks that we asked them to, to predict how they thought they would perform, both the healthy group and the mild cognitive impairment group would update their predictions and be a little bit more accurate with their actual level of performance. So that's where it gets really exciting um, because that gives us kind of a, a shoe in the door, a foot in the door for um, implementing some intervention studies in the future. Um, the other thing we found in our study was that informants, so those people who are kind of close relationally to our participants, were more accurate in predicting the, the mild cognitive impairment group's memory performance, whereas the informants were no more accurate for the healthy group than the participants themselves. So those with mild cognitive impairment, um, their informants were more accurate in their predictions. So what does this actually all mean for you? And I'm, again, I really kind of was heavy in the theory at the beginning, but I wanna make this applicable for you. So this means that metacognitive strategies may actually assist prospective memory performance in your daily life, regardless of whether you're someone who's healthy or someone who has a diagnosis of mild cognitive impairment. To be fair, and to, to put a caveat on this, this is still a hypothesis and it's yet to be tested in these populations, um, but there's a lot of literature that uses metacognitive intervention strategies in young adults and in healthy populations, so it doesn't feel like too much of a stretch to state that this could also be assistive in older adult and mild cognitive impairment populations, especially given that we saw um, some improvements in long-term perspective memory tests in our um, study that we did. So let's talk about some of those metacognitive intervention strategies. Um, we'll first focus on the concept of metacognitive monitoring and control. And we did briefly touch on that earlier, so it should be a little bit of a review, but we'll go over it again. And we'll talk about how those concepts inform the different metacognitive intervention strategies, including the use of predictions and postdictions, like what we used in my study. Um, as well as some well-tested and implemented strategies, such as um, goal, plan, do, review, which is a nice little rhyming metacognitive intervention strategy, and self-testing, which is a strategy that's primarily been used in um, educational literature, um, but it's still applicable and successful in other populations, too. So we'll start with the monitoring and control aspect of this. Let's refresh a little bit on these concepts. Um, as these are really central to our ability to implement the other strategies and have an understanding of why I'm kind of making these suggestions. So most metacognitive strategies play on this classic metacognitive monitoring model, and the focus is on monitoring your current behaviors and success on, on prospective memory tasks, and then figuring out how to better succeed in the future. So monitoring, the act of monitoring involves constant updating and attending to your performance on prospective memory tasks, whereas the control involves changing behaviors or implementing additional supports to be successful in a prospective memory task. So as an example, I'm gonna stick with that medication um, example that I used earlier. So let's say you're trying to remember to take a medication at 7 p.m. 
So monitoring this would be thinking regularly about how, when, and if a medication was taken on time and in the accurate dose. If somebody is successful without any problems or barriers, we could then say, or they could then think to themselves that they have a good memory for taking this particular medication. And then they could just continue to maintain whatever they did to help them do that successfully, whether they didn't use any um, strategies at all or supports, or whether they had to implement some strategies and supports to be successful. If somebody was unsuccessful at remembering to take their medication at 7 p.m., they met, might then start to think of ways to improve the next time that this task comes up. So they could exercise different mechanisms of control by potentially implementing reminder systems or ways to assist in their performance. And this could look like you know, an alarm, it could look like using a pillbox, it could be a notebook system or a check, check off to do list type of system, whatever strategy it is, you could implement it, and then attempt to see if those systems worked and were successful through monitoring and then implementing more systems if needed. Sometimes people have multiple systems in place and they need multiple systems in place. And figuring that out usually comes by um, monitoring how things went and analyzing what needs to change to be successful in the future, that, that metacognitive model. We could also kind of frame this in, in the um, world of predictions and postdictions. So the monitoring and control framework um, is really implicated in thinking about predicting our behavior and postdicting our behavior. Much of the literature on the use of predictions and postdictions has to do with judging how accurately somebody will be to do something. So this is sometimes in the form of, of confidence judgments in, in research. So it's saying something like, I'm 90% confident I'll complete this task without error. Um, or what I, and what I prefer is it to be in more of like a numerical self-rating form. I don't know if you guys have ever filled those out before, but where you're kind of rating yourself on certain behaviors and you're assigning yourself a number of how good you are at certain things. So you could rate how well you'll think you'll do on various prospective memory tasks throughout your day, whether that's taking a medication, brushing your teeth, turning off the stove, remembering everything on your grocery list when you go to the grocery store, any prospective memory task, you can kind of set up a prediction and postdiction rating for this. And to use the rating, you could use a one to five scale with five being having absolutely perfect performance and one being having the worst performance you think you could do. So this can be framed almost like a question to yourself, really, um, using a one to five scale. So you could say to yourself, on a scale of one to five, how good will I be at remembering to take my medication at 7 p.m. And then you'll give yourself a number. So one means I won't remember at all. I'm going to completely forget this task. Two could mean I'm going to remember long after I was supposed to, um, and I will probably take the wrong dose of my medication. Three would be remembering long after you're supposed to, but taking the correct dose. Uh, four would be remembering just a short time after you were supposed to and taking the correct dose. And five would be remembering it totally perfectly. So I remembered on time and I remembered at the correct dosage, just using that example. But this could be broken down to any, any prospective memory task. And then once you've made your prediction, you're going to go about your day. You're going to do what you need to do, do the tasks that are in between um, when you make the predictions and when the task is actually supposed to happen. And after the task has happened um, or <laughs> after you forgot about it and you realized you forgot about it, you're gonna complete a postdiction with the same type of rating scale. So as an example, one could be you didn't remember to complete the task at all, you remembered it long after, completed it incorrectly, or three would be you remembered it long after but completed it you know, correctly in certain aspects. Four would be you remembered a short time after but completed it correctly, and five would be you remembered it on time and perfectly. So you're using the same exact rating scale so you can compare your prediction 
and your post-diction. And you can see how accurate you were between those um, things. And then based on how accurate you are, you get to kind of update how you're, you're going to predict yourself and implement behaviors in the future to help you be successful. The reason that this is a metacognitive intervention is that predictions make you more mindful of your plan to remember something in the future and inherently make you pay attention to not only your timing, but the correctness of your task completion. And then completing the post-dictions makes you reflect or monitor um, your past performance and then update your approach for your future similar perspective memory tasks. So that's controlling those behaviors. So again, this is a classic metacognitive monitoring and control example, and it can be realistically done with any task using a smartphone to keep track of your predictions and postdictions, or if you prefer to use um, a notebook or post-its or whatever it may be, it's just really accessible and anyone can do this. And I end up recommending this a lot, um, especially to increase insight and awareness into how our memory is, is doing on a day-to-day -day basis for these really important tasks. Another classic metacognitive intervention strategy is the goal plan do review um, style of intervention. And I really like this one because it, it rhymes um, and it's only four steps, so it's quite easy to remember. It consists of setting a goal or otherwise known as setting whatever prospective memory task you're trying to remember and then planning exactly how you'll complete the task successfully. This does take some more time and thought to try to address any barriers that could get in the way um, and think of the methods that you want to use to to ensure your success. Um, but after you've made your plan, then you go about your day, the task happens and you either do it or you forget about it. Um, and then later on, you review how you did. So you reflect on whether your plan worked and if it didn't work or didn't fully work, you take time to analyze which part of the plan broke down to better incorporate changes to your plan um, in the future or for the next time you have to complete this prospective memory task. So again, this is more time intensive and it, it could feel a little monotonous for tasks that um, you know seem a little benign, like brushing our teeth and things like that. But whenever it comes to more important, especially health tasks that require your perspective memory to function accurately, I think this is a really great way of um, trying to get better at it and implementing these strategies. It'll just help you um, over time. And again, it rhymes, it's cute, it's easy. Um, it just is a little more time intensive. And the final more classic metacognitive monitoring technique I'll discuss is self-testing. Um, this is a known tried and true study technique that has been pervasive in the metacognitive literature throughout the dawn of metacognition's creation. Um, and it's basically exactly as it sounds. It requires you to actively test yourself on the prospective memory task or intention throughout the time period before the task occurs. So this requires a lot of self-rehearsal and monitoring how close you are to the time or even that the task is it there the event that it's attached to? Um, and by having to actively and, and frequently bring your awareness to the, to the perspective memory task and quiz yourself on how you're gonna remember it and what your plan is, you're more likely to remember the task itself and implement the behaviors you need for success. So an example of this would be, you know, sticking with the medication example, kind of figuring out your plan for how you're gonna take a medication. So if I say to myself, okay, I'm going to plan to take my medication at 7 p.m. to do this successfully. I'm going to set my alarm reminder and put a note next to my alarm where my medication is. Um, then you're going to kind of just throughout the day remind yourself, I'm going to take my medication at 7 p.m. My alarm's going to go off and I have a note where my medication is. And you'll do that a few times throughout the day because you're just constantly trying to pull that up and test your knowledge on that task. So you're more familiar with it and you're ready to go whenever that time occurs. And as I've been talking, you might be thinking to yourself, there are some pitfalls to these interventions. And I would say you're absolutely correct. 
Um, metacognitive interventions have been found to be useful in the literature, but there are a lot of pitfalls that can happen because these interventions require a lot of active abilities to monitor and think about your memory performance. And you have to remember to implement these intervention strategies and um, be able to reflect on what you're doing. So you're not only you know, trying to remember the task at hand, but you're also trying to remember to implement these strategies while you're trying to remember the task. So it kind of can compound and be a lot mentally to, to keep track of, which is why I've been talking so much about those external supports as well, using a notepad, using your smartphone, those types of strategies to help you keep track of, of these metacognitive interventions. Um, you must also be able to know when to implement different strategies to help you remember your perspective memory task, because part of metacognitive monitoring is also implementing those control behaviors to help you be successful. So your self-monitoring is only as good as your ability to implement behaviors to help you succeed. If you're monitoring and you can't implement strategies for your success, then the monitoring is really just taking up more mental space and is actually probably more distressing to you. Um, but if you do already have a pre-existing toolbox of strategies that help you with your memory, which I know is a big topic of um, these, these talks frequently, what types of strategies are helpful, then you can kind of choose from those, try them out, monitor how they go, and implement any changes you need to as you continue to move along. Um, and again, these strategies can be anything from alarms, reminder systems, calendar systems, notebooks, um, post-its if you're a post-it person, or relying on someone else in your environment for cues. The other thing to keep in mind is um, with metacognitive interventions, they're really only applicable for certain populations. So people who are healthy benefit from metacognitive interventions all the time. Um, people with mild cognitive impairment can, can benefit from these interventions and do, um, but those who have non-amnestic mild cognitive impairment tend to benefit more. Um, and I'm not sure if everyone is familiar with amnestic versus non-amnestic mild cognitive impairment, but non-amnestic is basically just that you have the preserved ability to remember things for short periods of time, enough to at least get you, um, you know, writing a note or, or get, putting your reminders in place. Metacognitive interventions are also beneficial with to those with limited disease progression. So people who haven't quite advanced yet um, into a, a full-blown dementia or um, more severe, uh, the more severe end of the spectrum of dementia, because at that point, it's really hard to implement these types of interventions. And they're best used with people who have really preserved insight. So the ability to kind of sit and self-reflect and say, okay, I didn't do so well on this task, but here's how I would do it differently in the future. So when, if your insight is, is impaired, then it makes it really hard to engage in some of these tasks. And earlier I brought up the topic of care partners and informants being a little bit more accurate in accuracy ratings of, of perspective memory performance. So care partners are actually pretty vital um, for people with mild cognitive impairments, and they can help assist by just providing small reminders here and there to certain tasks. Um, but like I mentioned a little bit earlier, care partners can often take on a lot of cognitive burden to keep track of everything in their own lives, in addition to prospective memory tasks for those who have mild cognitive impairment and that may be frequently forgetting about some things. So instead of care partners completely taking over certain prospective memory tasks that they don't need to, I'd actually encourage care partners to assist with providing some um, kind feedback and some cueing for those with mild cognitive impairment. Um, this would kind of look like a care partner's opinion on performance um, being given in a way that's that's helpful and useful. Like, you know, you meant to brush your teeth at 10 a.m. and um, I noticed that you didn't. What got in the way of that? Kind of giving these cues to, to help the person reflect a little bit more. Um, care partners may also learn to cue before a task is complete, like, oh, you had a task that you were going to do. Can you remember what it is? Or 
your task had to do with, and then kind of give a cue related. So if it's brushing your teeth, something that you should do in the bathroom every day and, and see if, if you can catch on as the person with mild cognitive impairment. That way the care partner is not kind of taking over this um, directory role and just kind of giving you things to do, but really more so providing cues and gentle guidance. And then after the task is complete, care partners may also learn to cue um, to reflect on your own performance. Like what was successful about how you did that or what could have gone better about that? Um, this can serve as a, a good prompt to kind of initiate or spark the reflection on certain perspective memory tasks. And if care partners can use similar phrases to give feedback or cueing to assist in these tasks, it can actually help people kind of provide their own language on how to monitor and how to reflect on performance. So in summary, having mild cognitive impairment does make perspective memory a little bit more difficult in your day-to-day -day life. Um, and we saw that in our study. And we think that using metacognitive strategies may assist future performance in perspective memory tasks. There are several different types of metacognitive intervention strategies to choose from, and it's okay to kind of pick and choose what worked best for you. The main premise is really just focusing on the monitoring or bringing awareness to our performance and then choosing the right control behaviors to help support our performance be, to be successful in the future. And if you aren't good at self-monitoring, it may be helpful to ask your care partner for feedback or cues to reflect on how you did and help you maybe come up with a plan to be better in the future. So this isn't putting the full onus on your care partner. It's just making sure that you're getting the um, cues and prompts that you need to be reflective and to monitor um, effectively. And thank you.